Well, I, I think it, it's obvious that oil built Wichita Falls, and at the same time, it is helping to rebuild it in the uh, 1980s. Um, our livelihood, uh, this financial institution, I think of many people in Wichita Falls is dependent upon that. John Gavin is a specialist in lending for the oil and gas industry. Because of the recent changes in oil business, any prospective investors have to be especially careful. Advisor to the North Texas Oil and Gas Association, Bob Benson. Two or three main bits of advice to protect the, the new investor in the oil industry is to pick the operator or the person in the oil industry with the greatest of care because ultimately one is relying on that oil man's integrity and competence to return a profit to you for your investment. Number two, find a, an advisor in whom you have faith. This can be a, an income tax accountant, a tax lawyer, geologist, geophysicist. This town and this area has an abundance of highly qualified people that one could hire as a consultant. Oil investment is not for everyone. You must be willing to lose almost everything you invest if something goes wrong. But despite the ups and downs of the business, the business does continue, and it requires investment. If you're interested, be sure that you're careful. I'm Jack Trammell, News Center 3. Meeting here in the midst of the North Texas oil fields, oil geologists are seeing an area like many across the country whose current oil boom is going bust, turning domestic oil investors' hopes of high profits into pipe dreams. Drilling rigs are being shut down, as uh, you may know, and uh, uh, we're expecting for many reasons, uh, complicated reasons, that uh, uh, total industry activity is going to be somewhat lower than it has been in the last few years. And therefore, there may be a, an oversupply of geologists. Old Texas oil fields are being rediscovered by oil geologists armed with new technology. The margin between cost and what we're what we're getting for our oil is, is shrinking. Therefore, there's going to be less activity because it's going to be a less desirable investment. Many oil geologists, like Robert Gunn, believe large new oil reserves in the U.S. must be found to keep domestic oil exploration alive. They estimate that 80% of the nation's future oil and gas is on federal land. But are those lands worth exploring? Oh, my heavens, yes, there are all over this nation, certainly and including Alaska. 
throughout the Rocky Mountain West, there are millions upon millions of acres of federal lands that have never been explored. We're Despite recent decisions by Secretary of the Interior James Watt to restrict oil exploration on federal land, oil geologists believe more easily exploited large reserves there could be a salvation to domestic exploration. Oil drilling has always been a gamble, but for geologists and investors, the domestic stakes may be getting too high. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. News events that shape North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. This is News Center 3. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A major fire broke out early this morning in a Houston hotel, killing 10 people. And an investigation continues. The NCAA basketball tournament is almost here as conference tournaments around the country wind down. And following the trend of the past few weekends, it will be warmer tomorrow. It is being called the worst fire in Houston in 10 years. The Westshire Hilton Hotel, built a few years ago, suffered a fire early this morning, which has killed 10 and seriously injured five people. NBC's Dan Molina reports that the building had no sprinkler system. Hilton Hotel, Houston, 3 o'clock this morning. Dan Molina, NBC News, Houston. Meanwhile, a pre-dawn fire in Corpus Christi killed one person today. The fire occurred at the city's second largest shopping mall. Firefighters say the blaze started in a clothing store in the Padre Staples Mall. Though the fire was confined to that one store, smoke damage was extensive, and the body of one woman has been recovered. Cause of that fire has yet been determined. A third major fire in Texas today caused some $400,000 worth of damage to several businesses in downtown Commerce, Texas. One of the businesses heavily damaged was the Commerce Journal newspaper. Officials say 40 firemen, including some from neighboring towns, fought the fire and fought that blaze for several hours. Good evening. Temperatures will drop again tonight. I'm Carol Copeland, News Center 3. In reference to the state of the economy, the Texas Farm Bureau reports that prices paid for last fall's harvest were so low that farmers had a tough time breaking even. This spring, the worry is still borrowing enough money to be able to plant a crop. Bankers met this past week at Texas A&M University and heard an explanation of the problem. When government... Congressman Phil Graham said that farmers had been lulled into a false sense of security. For the past decade, they were borrowing against the skyrocketing value of their land despite a severe cash flow problem in their crops. And government programs didn't help either. This problem was compounded by the fact that for the pre... Yesterday, News Center 3 found the very first instance of less than a dollar per gallon gasoline in Wichita Falls at this service station near the downtown area. But today, the gasoline is seven cents more per gallon. This Jeffy convenience store is like many other locations where gasoline is sold. All of them are seeing gas price fluctuations. Yesterday at the other station, gasoline was 99.9 .9 cents a gallon. Right. Today it is $1.6.9 mm -hmm. cents per right. gallon. Why the sudden increase? Because the competitors are in that area of town are within that range and our prices are competitive all over town no matter what they are. Is gas pricing in this area really getting that fiercely competitive? Yes, it is. If, you know, if they want a gas war, we're ready to handle it. You, know? you are seeing these gas price signs being changed almost daily in Wichita Falls because the gasoline business is becoming competitive again. And for the consumer, more competition means lower prices. Do you think that gas prices will continue to go down? Well, all I can base it on is just past experience, and uh, we just came down another three cents, so... Yes, I'd say it, it looks like it's going to. The drop of 10 to 15 cents a gallon has gasoline buyers delighted. I'm glad that it go down. There's a more point for the better the leaving. <laughs> oh, I love them. Yeah, the better the better off I am, the more, more they go down, the better off I am. There may not be any gas wars in Wichita Falls, but what we may be seeing are the very first skirmishes. I'm Jack Trammell, News Center 3.
Last week, an Air Force sergeant discovered a bomb which she had unknowingly carried by plane from Washington, D.C. That bomb was transported in aircraft-to-aircraft -aircraft baggage to the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. That incident has brought present airport security to question. A bomb was able to make its way to Wichita Falls through this airport. How was that possible? Well, this uh, piece of luggage was checked luggage. It was not carry-on luggage. So when it came into this airport, it was simply taken off one airplane and put onto another airplane. That kind of luggage is not routinely screened, such as you're thinking of with the pre-board screening, which is designed to prevent hijackings rather than bombs specifically. Despite isolated incidents, then, is it really still necessary to security check everyone who wants to get on a plane? To me, it is, it is saying to 23 and a half million passengers at this airport, you're guilty until proven innocent. And uh, to me, I think the, the threat uh, that, that it certainly has eliminated uh, may not be as great as, as it once was. Texas Representative Martin Frost of Dallas has asked that the Federal Aviation Administration look into the Wichita Falls bomb scare incident and to find out how the bomb escaped detection by security officials. Despite the drop of hijackings in the United States, airport security personnel regularly find weapons. And for that reason alone, airport security officials believe that there is no need to relax screening procedures. At the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for News Center 3. What you see behind me here are railroad tracks leading virtually into oblivion. Weaves grow between these tracks now because this is the end of the line, the Katy Line, the MKT Line, which ran just north of Granville, Oklahoma, all the way through to Altus. The line has been closed for years, but soon that may change, and that may change some people's lives. Granfield businessman Jim Montgomery believes the state-sponsored, federally paid $5 million renovation will greatly affect the livelihoods of many. I think that most importantly, it means a preservation of a way of life, that the, the economic impact of the loss of this railroad would have meant that a lot of farmers would have gone out of business. The cities of Grandfield and Duval have been receiving regular rail service, but farmers have had to truck their wheat and cotton to these towns from as far away as 50 miles. That's expensive, but the reopening of the rail line would change that. The ability to ship your products to port by rail is going to enable the farmer to uh, to have a better marketing position and better compete with other farmers in the United States. If someone said, give me a shopper's list of the problems of this particular line, this particular stretch of line, what would you tell them? Spikes such as this one that can be removed easily by hand. Underneath that, we have a broken tie itself. And most of the ballast of the rock that holds this Ever track up has been the forced out from under the track. The entire line to be repaired runs from Burke Burnett, Texas, to Altus, Oklahoma, a total stretch of some 70 miles. It is hoped that when the renovation is completed on this MKT line that it will bring new lifeblood to commerce and industry and ultimately to the people of southwest Oklahoma. But the line is in need of great repair, and when that help comes is yet to be seen. Near Granfield, Oklahoma, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for News Center 3. Working the land and watching his 14 grandchildren grow up. We weren't going to do like so many people do. Go down to Florida and find a place to die. That one we weren't going to do that. We have... Uh, planned on not really changing our lifestyle, but Though almost a third of Braniff employees have been laid off since 1979, the Dallas-based airline has had recent difficulty in meeting its payroll. Braniff had record losses last year of $160 million and is now faced with $733 million in long-term debts. Amidst rumors of bankruptcy, the Dallas Morning News reported that Braniff President Howard Putnam could not guarantee the company would not be out of business in 30 days. That story was a misquote, according to Braniff Vice President Sam Coates, who says rumors of Braniff's death have been greatly exaggerated. Braniff is alive and going strong. Our operations are in full tilt. Uh, we've had an economic problem for about two years, and we're working through it. And we've had to do some very dramatic things in re recent months to avoid a crisis. But Braniff is in the process of renegotiating its entire debt structure with its lenders. We've obtained a lot of help for our, from our employees, and the public is beginning to respond just beautifully. It makes us very 
pleased that we are a Texas airline. Braniff blames its troubles on overexpansion of the airline after federal deregulation, the high cost of fuel, low ridership, and inflation. Braniff officials believe that it will be from one to one and a half years before they are again financially off the ground. At the Dallas-Fort Worth Regional Airport, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Time. Has paid into it, felt I paid my dues, and really I don't want anybody making it. I see Glenn Denning has been paying Social Security taxes since 1937. He's worked hard. This is the city of Wichita Falls, Texas, a city literally built on the vast oil fields of North Texas and Southern Oklahoma. In a sagging economy, Wichita Falls has done well with a renewed oil boom once brought on by high oil prices. However, the number of wells being drilled around here is dropping rapidly because of lower tax allowances, high equipment costs and interest rates, and most importantly, dropping oil prices in a world oil glut. The decision by OPEC last weekend to stop that glut and raise prices was greeted by Texas and Oklahoma oil men as very good news. Well, surely it is, because uh, we need to have price stability. Uh, the price of the product needs to be stable over a long period of time so that we can justify long-term planning and uh, expenditures for exploration that uh, will lead to energy independence for this country. This oil well fire near Chillicothe, Texas, has been burning out of control since March the 10th. It is a spectacular example of the expense and high risks involved in oil investment. This single well fire destroyed a million dollar rig and is costing the company that owns it over $100,000 a day. Local oilmen here concede that only if oil prices stabilize and only if oil prices increase will they be willing to gamble any more on domestic oil. Near Chillicothe, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Delicious fresh fruit taste. Fresh fruit in real fruit juices tastes great. It is called angioplasty, and it's a new technique to open blocked arteries, an ailment common to the aged and heavy smokers. These little catheters are used to unplug small localized areas of blockage in arteries that prevent blood flow down a leg primarily. You can also use it in an arm. This new super catheter is inserted down a blood artery, and a small balloon at the tip is expanded with saline water, forcing the artery closure to open. The results of such a clearance of the artery is almost immediate. In the past, blocked arteries had to be repaired with expensive surgery and subsequent hospitalization. Texas Medicine Magazine says that angioplasty could save some patients from one-third to one-half the cost of such surgery. In general, it's uh, people that have peripheral vascular disease, and these are caused by high blood pressure and diabetes and smoking and a bad family history of blood vessel disease. Uh, primarily, we're seeing it more and more in middle-aged smokers. But angioplasty is not for everyone. Many people have such widespread artery failure that the extension of an arterial catheter is infeasible. The American College of Radiology claims that angioplasty represents another example of interventional radiology. And with the use of new supercatheters, radiologists are already doing everything from stopping stomach ulcers to removing kidney stones. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for sure NBC they're News. Get out of it with as little problem as possible. Negotiators are talking mainly to the leader of the group. Our only business. Three people. Slick streets throughout Wichita Falls caused by all this rain have led to a flurry of automobile accidents until this evening all involved little more than fender benders. However, around 7.45 this evening, a two-car collision at the intersection of Montgomery and Kemp sent three people to General Hospital. Plumley Ambulance told News Center 3 that none of the injuries appeared very serious. Talking to Wichita General Hospital, they have now been identified as 19-year-old James Farmer, his 16-year-old wife Denise, and Anita Farmer, who is 24 years old. All of them were identified as being from Burke Burnett. On the eve of national elections in El Salvador, American observers have fanned out across the nation as part of an international watch force. NBC's Dan Melita reports that rebel-promised violence has already begun. By late this morning, the guerrillas had started making good on their promise to attack on the day before the El Salvador elections. This fighting is just outside the city of Usulatan. 
While there are rumors of compromise in the air concerning President Reagan's budget in the hands of Congress, Andrea Mitchell reports that presidential aides are placing a firm's hands off on tax cuts. The White House is ready to negotiate within limits. It takes lots of equipment to pump black gold from the ground and get it to you, the consumer. Public service announcements like this one on Channel 3 have been attempting to put a dent in the multi-million dollar oil theft business, where thousands of gallons of crude oil and thousands of dollars worth of pumps and pipes can disappear overnight. If you have information about an oil field theft, call Collect, 817-723-1114. A reward is offered, and you'll be doing yourself and the country a favor. Local oil producers believe they will be doing themselves a big favor by working together to fight a growing crime problem. The North Texas Oil and Gas Association has just published this oil field security booklet, which is available to any area oil producer. And we hope the industry will take it and use it, and that it will be effective in cutting down theft in oil fields. Most of the booklet is dedicated towards small tips to increase oil field security. Tips on security, only security, how to spot uh, and look for on a day-to-day -day basis incidents of theft on the lease. And oil field thefts can be enormously expensive. For example, this one stretch of pipe could cost as much as $160 to replace. Many North Texas oil producers have felt the sting of oil field ripoffs, and one of them believes the new booklet will help. Yes, it should be a considerable help, and it should be, should be helpful to the people that work for us. In recent months, there has been a crackdown of sorts in North Texas, but the North Texas Oil and Gas Association feels that oil field theft crime prevention best begins with oil producers. Near Blue Mound, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for News Center 3. But one of them thrives. We have two reports. First, Norma Quarles. It takes lots of equipment to pump black gold from the ground and get it to you, the consumer. This equipment is expensive, and thieves in the oil patch are making petroleum products cost even more than they should. The Oil and Gas Associations of Texas don't think that you, the consumer, should have to foot the bill for this extra cost. If you have information about an oil field theft, call Collect, 817-723-1114. A reward is offered, and you'll be doing yourself and the country a favor. Empty buildings used to be banks, garages, and retail The controversy between Monte County and the city of Bowie involves how much each side is willing to pay for ambulance and fire service for the county. Bowie city officials say that unless the county agrees to take more of the burden off of Bowie taxpayers, it will stop sending ambulances and stop putting out fires outside Bowie city limits. Well, we feel that the city's responsibility is to the citizens of our city, and that the responsibility of the citizens out of the county, out in the county, is the responsibility of the commission's court. Bowie City officials want Monte County to increase funding of the ambulance and fire department around $1,900 a month. The county has counter-offered $1,200 a month. We are paying more than what we feel is our fair portion of the, of the expense for the loss. We feel that it was fair to this time. The county now wishes to uh, limit their funding to a certain amount, which is not enough to meet our needs. Monte County has no countywide fire department. It does have, however, limited ambulance service in the north part of the county. But most affected in the middle of the fighting are some 3,000 or so residents of the south part of Monte County who have no backup fire or ambulance systems. One of them is Ray Darty. The people on 287, as well as the people in the rural areas, are not going to have any ambulance service as of April the, the 1st, due to the fact that the county, the city, and whoever else can't get together enough to come along and say, hey, uh, let's resolve this issue. They've been fighting about it and bickering about it, and now it's down to the people who are going to get killed, hurt, and maimed out on the highway as well as in the rural areas. Both city and county officials agree on one point. They have heard very little from the citizens of the southern part of Monte County who will be affected. They may not hear those outcries until after April 1st when ambulance and fire service will apparently be terminated. In Bowie, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for News Center 3. And they like what they... 
A new eight-page guide is being distributed to department heads and supervisors within the Wichita Falls City Administration, and it tells how they are to deal with employee grievances within the city. Those who drive ambulances find themselves under unique pressure. And racing to save lives, the driver must protect the safety of his patient, while at the same time pushing his vehicle to the limit for the sake of time and speed. But a California company believes that ambulance drivers can be made better drivers and safer drivers with a unique black box device that monitors how much strain the ambulance vehicle is taking. If you're driving along and you have to make a hard turn, the alarm goes off. The city manager, Stuart Bach, felt this badly outdated. The first page of the booklet quick. says that it is the purpose of this administrative policy to, quote, way, assure city employees the that their work-related grievances will be treated in a fair and timely manner, the passenger quote. Seat. The data city personnel director, is Joanne to fail Garrett, safe says driving that making for evaluation about how to the handle that employee tells the ambulance service is where the key. It needs to improve, to even offering special ambulance driving process. safety courses. So we took the this is the main reason we're putting it in. The patient would not be tossed about as much in the rear of the ambulance while riding in, say, to the hospital if the driver has learned how to control it with this computer. Beeping, clicking, and counting monitor acts like an electronic tattletail. With increasingly sophisticated and expensive vehicles, some 300 ambulance companies nationwide are using similar systems to determine just how good their drivers really are. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting problems for NBC and its employees, but has been the result of long-range planning. But whether or not this booklet will have any effect on future city and city employee relations has yet to be seen. I'm Jack Trammell, News Center 3. The American Council of Education has a trade magazine called Higher Education and National Affairs. This magazine says that the job market is depressed this summer and is expected to remain so for college graduates through the 1980s. But there are some points of hope, particularly for students in technical and scientific departments, and one department in particular. That field is petroleum engineering and geology. This year, the average starting salary for a graduate student in petroleum geology is over $30,000 a year. The National College Placement Council says that these students are among the highest paid college graduates ever. The job market is a little soft at the moment as it is nationwide because of uh, the current recession. But the long-term uh, need for people uh, either in geology, geophysics, or petroleum engineering, we expect will be excellent for years to come. But the number of active oil rigs in the United States has dropped by one half. That is the sharpest decline in the nation's history. Oil associations say the domestic oil market is in deep trouble. I expect uh, we shall have a recovery. 
uh, I don't I don't see how things can go any other way and therefore the field is just as desirable today as it was a year ago oil has always been a tough business seeing more than its share of ups and downs and while keeping one eye on their studies students are keeping their other eye on the oil industry I think it will turn around eventually I'm, you, I'm positive I understand you know the situation but I am positive that we need energy in Wichita Falls Texas I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News According to the United States Census Bureau, about one-fifth of all new single-family homes in the nation are being built by their owners. High building costs are forcing many to learn how to use a hammer and saw for the first time. But rather than start from scratch, hard-pressed consumers are turning to an alternative called kit houses, which start as low as $10,000. Like giant tinker toy sets, such packages include everything from basic lumber to linoleum, from carpeting to even the kitchen sink and they seem to attract people who don't normally have house building experience. But kit home sales aren't brisk. This eighth largest lumber chain in the United States has sold some 3,000 kits in the past two years, but they could have sold more. Money's tight right now, plus the fact that banks are real uh, strict about who they loan money to on a builder type loan. They, they would like to have someone with a previous history in some type of transaction like that, and most people just don't have that history. Working evenings and weekends, Robert Dodd has been putting his house kit together since this spring. With the help of his brother-in-law, Dodd believes he can save about half the money he would have spent for a home already built. And he plans to take the money he saves on the outside and put it into some of the better things on the inside. Even the best are going to make mistakes. You're going to have to start from scratch and you're going to do things and have to start over. So you must decide if the money spent or saved is worth the quality you get when you build from a kit or buy a home built by conventional builders. Near Dean, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Seeing a dog chase a postman right out of a yard is perhaps considered sheer Americana, like something out of the Dagwood Bumstead comic strips. But the Postal Service is not amused. Over 5,700 postal carriers were bitten by dogs last year. Dogs that owners allowed to run loose. And the U.S. Postal Service says the problem is not getting any better, so they are getting tougher. If your dog harasses your postman, he can suspend your mail. If he's a big enough threat, he can suspend all of your neighbor's mail as well. Like many letter carriers, Judy Osborne doesn't think it's very funny either. She still has scars from a poodle attack. Well, I was going down the street and I went to step up on a porch and a little girl opened the door and the dog came out and before I could even say anything, the dog had, you know, was already trying to bite me. And he did. He got away with it. Your letter carrier is armed with a required chemical canister that they carry. They can spray it into a dog's face if they are attacked. It doesn't hurt the dog. The problem of attacking dogs has become so severe, the Postal Service has announced it is redoubling efforts to create safe distances between problem dogs and its carriers, even if that means holding up the mail, even if that means providing attorneys to carriers who are suing owners after being attacked. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. This week, the Mexican peso is worth around one American penny. With the devaluation of the peso, tourists in Mexico can buy goods and services at almost half of what they would have paid a month ago. Suddenly, Mexico has become a vacation bargain and a delight to travel agents who are seeing an increase in business. We have certainly felt, uh, felt the increase in the past, oh, the past month or so, you know. Uh, there's quite an interest. People calling in for vacations right now. Some of you were checking for vacations down as far back as, uh, as Christmas. Mexico has always been popular with American tourists. The U.S. Travel and Tourism Administration says that last year, 
three and a half million Americans spent nearly three billion dollars in Mexico. It's American 321. But there are two seats available. Despite efforts to bolster the peso, no one yet knows its future value, forcing Mexican hotels to accept advance reservations, but without any guarantees of their future prices. If, you, if you're looking as far down as Christmas, at this point, they will not quote you the right. They'll reserve the room, and they're a little hesitant as to what, uh, what rate is going to be in effect at that time. Why? simply because of the, of the value of the peso, what's it going to be then? The devaluation of the peso has created a flood of Mexican aliens into the United States, but it may also be causing a sudden reverse flood of American tourists into Mexico, putting much-needed tourist dollars into the beleaguered Mexican economy. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Like the smoking of men's cigarettes, dipping snuff is being promoted as very Western, very manly, and it is a growing fad, particularly in Southern and in Western states. U.S. Tobacco, one of the largest snuff distributors in the United States, says that snuff is also catching on in the Great Lakes states, in mines and steel mills where smoking is not allowed. But the largest group of new snuff users are young people, and that has dentists worried. As opposed to the effects of smoking tobacco, the effects of snuffing or chewing tobacco in young people may be a long-term uh, situation before we really know what the results will be. Dentists fear that snuff and chewing tobacco could cause everything from gum and tooth deterioration to blisters. In Texas, there are no state regulations against selling snuff and chewing tobacco to minors. And even though snuff is made of tobacco and contains nicotine, whether it causes cancer or not is still unknown. This is the thing that we are fearful of. Are we seeing then early changes that ultimately, with continued use of the product as it has been, that would lead to the development of a true cancer? One snuff company says its sales are increasing about four to six percent a year. Though sales are attributed to the current popularity of the American cowboy and fears of lung cancer, the American Tobacco Institute says snuff and chewing tobacco sales are expected to increase for years to come. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. At times, they have been called the Ghost Squadron, and ghosts may very well live in these World War II airplanes parked on this abandoned Navy training field at Norman, Oklahoma. Bombers, cargo planes, fighters, and trainers sit quietly now, but they are not part of an air museum. They belong to the Confederate Air Force, an association that believes ghosts were meant to fly. Uh, we're not uh, concerned so much with the fact that the, uh, the airplane is antique. We're, we're concerned primarily with that era from 1939 to 1945, and the, the fact that uh, the, the country as a whole banded together and uh, fought the war. The Confederate Air Force is a private association that has hundreds of such aircraft on their roster. Many of them are maintained today by men who flew them in World War II. And keeping 40-year-old aircraft in the air is no easy task. Parts are nearly impossible to find and occasionally are jerry-rigged. But in paradox, the simplicity of technology then may be the reason World War II aircraft are surviving now. The Confederate Air Force holds air shows all across the United States they are attempts to bring back an era, an era when times and airplanes were simple, and when it appeared then that men had more control over their destinies. Technology was not quite as advanced as it is now, and uh, the modern aircraft, they're flown by uh, auto automation. This was done by the man in the cockpit. And that, that in itself means that the man was the achiever while he was flying the machine. In Norman, Oklahoma, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News.
This is Search for Tomorrow. Many people may think that being a soap opera star is a fast-paced and extraordinarily romantic profession. They are apparently at least partly right. On the NBC soap opera Search for Tomorrow, Susan Scannell, who is the redhead here, and Michael Corbett, who is the man just about to be punched, play brother and sister. Warren and Kristen Carter in the classic soap opera of love and hate, power and passion, and a constant battle to look out for each other. Boy, I can do a lot more! <laughs> However, after the lights go down, it's sometimes difficult for Scannell and Corbett to escape their roles. I think it's just basically part of the job, really. The only thing, I, you know, that bothers me is, is sort of being referred to... People talk around you. Let's say you're in a subway or something, and two people recognize you, and you're standing, they'll say, do you know who that is? Yeah. Do you know who that... And they totally ignore the fact that you're there listening to this whole thing, and they completely ignore you. Both Susan Scannell and Michael Corbett say they are not sure if soaps are more heavily produced because they are more popular or are more popular because they are more heavily produced. Whatever the case, they are popular. And Susan Scannell says she thinks she knows why. Right now, I think our society is just getting away from a very selfish me, my career, me only time. And so people are looking for something to have in common. It sounds like, oh, wow, soap operas are going to save the world. That's not what I mean. But it's something <laughs> in common that they can talk about, you know? Search for Tomorrow came to NBC in March of this year. It is one of the longest running soap operas, and it is very popular. And though searching for tomorrow is not easy, often frantic and usually fast paced, both Susan Scannell and Michael Corbett say it is a lifetime career of acting, which will always have a tomorrow. NBC's Saturday Night Live is different from anything else. It is an unprecedented challenge in comic acting. Being a good actor is difficult, but being funny is harder, especially when it's live. Now, those words come from stand-up comedian Joe Piscopo, known best today as the zany sportscaster on NBC's Saturday Night Live. And it's, it's a tough life, you know. Uh, the money's not bad, I guess, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a gas. I'm having a good time. People have grown up on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Once immature children are now immature adults watching Saturday Night Live. <laughs> now wait a minute, Jack. Now <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Joe Piscopo says that doing comedy on Saturday Night Live is different because it is live. And if a sketch doesn't come out funny, there aren't any built-in laugh tracks to save it. Well, without a guaranteed laugh track in front of a live audience, does that put pressure on the humor? I'm so glad you asked that question. Seriously, people don't understand how tough it is to do a live show. We don't sweeten that show. The sweeten means, you know, not put an extra laugh track underneath there. And we, we, sketches are structured in that show uh, for actors that can make it there after makeup changes. And uh, it, but, but it's, 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 it's so exciting and it's live. It's, it's just great. Piscopo's best-known character on Saturday Night Live is one he developed watching television at home. What was your favorite character? Probably the sports guy. Probably the sports guy. Why? I enjoy sports so much, and uh, it's it's there must be such so much a part of me, uh, the sports character, that it's easy to do for me. So we couldn't resist. We asked Joe Piscopo to do his best for the Channel Three Sports Department. Hello again, everybody. Joe Piscopo live Saturday Night Sports. The big story: Steve Ruska. Tim Matthews, exciting, creative, okay, back to you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> say, this has been the finest part of all.
It's an all-new Chips this fall with new chases, new faces. The NBC television show Chips is now into its sixth year. Six years straight running for TV shows these days is a long time. There is a change, though, this year. Co-star Larry Wilcox has been replaced by ex-model Tom Riley. But regardless of the change, Eric Estrada says Chips has been a good public relations show for police officers in general. Yes, yes, in a sense that um, California Highway Patrol has had, since we've been on the air, its enlistment request for motorcycle officers. It's doubled or tripled, I've heard. So it's been a good public relations tool? It has, yes. Shooting schedules for Chips are fast, fierce, and furious. Estrada plays Ponch Poncherello, and he says he's used to the strain. Only slightly slowed when a 1,200-pound motorcycle fell on him three years ago, nearly killing him. His new co-star says joining such a long-running series isn't a problem at all. No, I, I think this is the best opportunity for me because uh, it seems that, that I have basically fit in with the family and the groove of the show. Mm -hmm. Though Chips is now six years old, Eric Estrada says he believes shows that present working people that the audience can relate with will continue to succeed. Yes. Those born in the World War II baby boom are now adults, and as middle-aged Americans, many of them are experiencing the need for corrected vision. The American Optometric Association says optimistically, this latest adult generation will be more receptive to contact lenses. Well, the market share is about to increase quite a bit because uh, of the new introduction of bifocal soft lenses especially. Uh, that's going to increase the uh, market share dramatically especially as current soft lens wearers get into bifocal age. So it is no accident that there is furious competition between contact manufacturing companies who are spending millions of dollars on research. And it is no accident that there are sudden technological innovations on the horizon to capture the fashion-conscious baby boom generation. Besides soft contact bifocal lenses, you're likely to see contacts that can be worn from four to six weeks, tinted contacts, and even cosmetic contacts that will be able to change the very color of your eyes. But most of these ideas are still on hold pending full approval of the Food and Drug Administration. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Americans are becoming more and more hungry for news. And in an information world where people are increasingly dependent on each other, television news has taken a role beyond simple headlines. It has become for many an absolute necessity. NBC News Overnight began on July the 5th this year. It was the first late night, full hour network television newscast. Its purpose is to provide news to viewers who have not seen the early network news and more importantly, looks ahead to the events of the coming morning. It is co-anchored by Lloyd Dobbins and Linda Ellaby. Well, maybe they are, or maybe it's just that they are demanding and getting news at a time they want it, which for some people is 6 o'clock in the evening and for others is 1.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. If you are a doctor or a nurse and you're working 4 to midnight, you haven't seen the 6 o'clock news in the evening, and the chances are you're not going to be up for the Today Show. What makes NBC News Overnight different from other newscasts is that it offers things not found in other news programs. Once Overnightly, for example, is a brief recap of the day's news. And for those stories that were interesting but never made it to the air before, there is the not ready for primetime news. And finally, of course, there are sports. It's a separate skill and one that we have never used or had. Or mastered. Or mastered. <laughs> But sports notwithstanding, Lloyd Dobbins believes it is worth it to many people to watch overnight. Uh, we decided that we would not be like the others, that we would do things somewhat differently, staying within the bounds of reporting fact, uh, telling stories as best we could. Falco discovered...
specifically cold. Outside of marijuana, aloe vera is probably the latest, fastest growing cash crop in the United States, and it's legal. Most of it is grown in Texas. The crop at this farm alone is estimated to be worth three to four million dollars. An acreage going to aloe vera has increased nearly 20-fold in Texas since 1975. Aloe vera is related to both the lily and the onion, but the green gel inside the plant is being used in a rapidly expanding market of tonics, food additives, cosmetics, and cure-alls, even an aloe vera drink. And the Back to Nature movement is getting the credit. I think that ultimately, with the advancement in technology that we have in this country today, that we will see uh, scientific people being able to tell us why aloe does the many wonderful things that it does do, rather than being a folk medicine, as it's commonly referred to today. Though used in cosmetics for years, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has determined nothing scientific about what aloe can do for human illnesses. But the future of the plant for dermatology may be brighter. Preliminary studies that have been done have been uh, sort of tantalizing. They have, uh, they have shown that uh, there seems to be some uh, efficacy in speeding healing. Some aloe vera growers are afraid that overblown claims that aloe vera can cure everything from ulcers to stretch marks will turn it into a snake oil. They say that would be the kiss of death. Instead, they feel there is a better future for their crop if it is slowly accepted as a new wide-range natural medicine. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. Sure, I've got a full-time job, but these days it helps to have a little extra money coming in every month just to keep up with the cost of living. Custom-produced advertisements like this are part of the Army National Guard's National Recruitment Program. Enlistment in the National Guard is up, and National Guard officials in Washington say they are seeing immense growth, now standing at nearly 95% of authorized strength of 430,000 men nationwide. But many new recruits are joining for the roughly $75 to $200 the Guard pays for one weekend a month of work. And additional money is being heavily promoted by the Army National Guard as a good reason to enlist. Look, it isn't exactly going to cover the mortgage, but it sure helps. Put your military skills back to work. Without a doubt, there, that has had some effect on, on the manning of not only the National Guard, but on, on the full-time side of the house, too. Uh, times get a little hard, and uh, uh, jobs a little harder to find, and uh, people do kind of look to the military. Guard officials quickly add that many join their ranks to learn a new trade. Others, they say, join because patriotism is making a comeback in America. Eldon Haddox is also trying to make a comeback. Recently laid off from an oil equipment manufacturing company, Eldon Haddox is trying to make ends meet. And money had a lot yes, to do with will. his decision. It helps out to these, these days. Did me, I didn't have anything. So this sounds like a good idea. In effect, the Guard is likely the largest part-time employer in the United States. And they say they are doing their job by providing those jobs with the most cost-efficient money spent on the military. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News. The Motorcycle Safety Foundation says motorcycles make up only 4% of the nation's registered vehicles. However, they are involved in almost 10% of all traffic deaths. The foundation is now promoting a system called MOST, or Motorcycle Operator Skill Test. The test evolved from five years of study by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The MOST test is the most elaborate motorcycle licensing exam ever. It requires not only a written examination, but also a comprehensive off-street skill test, which must be passed. The Motorcycle Safety Foundation says Texas trails only California in the number of motorcycle deaths and accidents occurring each year. Texas does not use the most system, but instead has only a short written test and a short driving test on open roads. But with one quarter of a million more motorcycles on the road every year nationally, Texas, like other states, may have to start Just tightening to motorcycle licensing procedures. I think this would certainly help to reduce the statistics that is displayed in the accident frequency on motorcycles. This is one of the things that can help in this area. 
The Mo system is very new. However, the Motorcycle Safety Foundation says the 11 states that use it are seeing a decline in motorcycle accidents and deaths, and that seven more states plan to adopt the advanced motorcycle tests this year. In Wichita Falls, Texas, I'm Jack Trammell reporting for NBC News.